<laughs> All right. Perfect. All right. Well, it's very good to be here. And um, yeah, so, you know, this room where our guests from Poland were talking about the land grant system, and this room represents the land grant system. I mean, we got, we got research specialists, and, and what's our job? You know, our job is to be current with the science, to do innovative research that pushes, that pushes the science, and then package that science into information that's directly useful to people. Uh, you know, to our clientele, whoever that is, in this case, strawberry growers. But one thing that's key to me is, you know, I don't sit in my room thinking about what next we should do with strawberries. You know, who, who informs our work? And I, I call it the dance between the practice and the science. You know, we do a lot of work with growers, we do a lot of work with agents, we travel around a lot, we go to a lot of meetings. And so those things really inform the type of questions that we ask. And um, uh, and then and then we ask those questions and, and then do the field work or do the lab work, whatever needs to be done. But we're pretty mission oriented, usually problem solving. And even though there's a lot of financial stress in the university systems, I think uh, you know it's a great job because I've never had anybody tell me to get <coughs> off the farm. Right? Usually I'm there by invitation, and I'm there. I tell them, you don't want me on your farm because <laughs> I'm a plant pathologist, which means you got a problem if I'm on your farm, right? So that's one. And then, the, then you're just the agent network. I mean, here in Arkansas, North Carolina, and a lot of places still, there's just a great interplay between the agents, the growers, specialists, university systems, and the exchange of knowledge. So, uh, so that's what this room represents, I think. Now, um, we have a pretty diverse audience. So, it's, it's meant to be pretty informal, so you got to push back about, you know, if you have questions, let me stop, because I don't mind skipping through some slides or some uh, stuff if we, can, if we need to talk and hone in on an area. Okay, so please, please feel free to do that. Make sure it's, it's quite informal. And I, I'm going to have two talks, one this morning. It's on uh, fumigation and management of soil-borne diseases, and then this afternoon, it's going to be on uh, mostly fruit rot diseases and some other things. All right, so um, whenever I talk, you know, really what we want to do when we're managing diseases or any pests, if it's weeds, insects, you know, we want to use whatever tool is at our disposal. If that's a biological approach, if that's a cultural management approach, or if that's, you know, a fungicide or insecticide approach. Uh, whether it be OMRI approved or not OMRI approved, either one, depending on your farming system. So we always want to uh, promote IPM. The other thing is, I think, you know, when you're thinking about strawberries, and um, Alina did a very nice job of, of laying the groundwork, um, you know, it's a, it's a pretty intensive system overall. It takes a lot of effort, and I think as we move uh, Depending on strawberry systems, some of our strawberry growers have grown the same crop on the same land for 10 to 30 years, right? And that's because they were able to fumigate. And if you started getting away from those kind of products, then you got to you got to think more about processes. And so I'm going to talk about that too, more farming management systems. And I kind of joke with people, um, you know, if 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 you take this here, A plus B equals X, that's very linear. Like when people said, oh, we're losing methyl bromide, what should we do? Well, I can, I can pretty much say, you know, the, your best option is going to be using pit chlor 60 at this rate, using VIF film, using two knives, and inject it, you know, at, at, in, in the fall and August. And then you'll get really good disease control and, and modest weed control. So that's really A plus B plus X. And I think an extension that's very attractive because we can say, use this product at this rate, you get this outcome. But when you think about farming systems, it's more, it's more like this matrix here, right? I say, well, what, how can I control my diseases in my organic systems? Well, you know, if you have this rotation program, if you have this type of cover crop, if you have this kind of planting date, if you have this kind of cultivar, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it becomes a, a much more of a matrix. And I can't exactly tell you what X will be, right? So it's a, it's a much more of a matrix. And so some people get frustrated 
especially with extensions, say, well, I just want the recommendation, but a lot of times, you know, it's got to be integrated into the system. So that's that's one of the core core foundations to think about as we think about our systems. A lot of our work has been supported by a lot of agencies, and so it's really important. It has been for us to have great partners. We do a lot of on-farm research, and uh, I kind of joke, and I'll come back to that, but. You know, I kind of joke that when we do on-farm research, we have a vote. And I always give 51% of the vote to the grower. Mm -hmm. So if the vote is, should we do this practice or not? And if it's, you know, if it's more practical oriented or science oriented, then we have a vote. And the farmer votes one way, I'll vote the other way. He gets 51% of the vote, we go his way, right? Mm -hmm. It's gotta work, it's gotta work on the farm. And that's, that's the key for us. Um, and so we get we get uh, support from most of our strawberry grower associations and our vegetable grower associations, but you know they don't have a lot of money. They got about twenty thousand dollars in research. I get about two or three thousand. That's almost enough for me to pay for my people to go to the meeting and give presentations. All right? It doesn't drive the research, but what it does do, and I think if you're growers here, you really want to make sure that you have grower organization meetings that you document your priorities and then you put them publicly accessible. Because then I can go there and I can go to USDA and say, hey, this is a grower identified issue. These are the priorities in the industry and we can take that $1 and so far, on average, we make it 46 more. Okay, so that's very important. I think if you're agents or you're working with grower groups, that's really important. Especially in today's industry. It used to be most faculty were supported by the university. Now, um, I'm also working in a center called the Center for IPM. We even have to raise money to pay our own rent, right? So we pay our rent, we pay 95% of the operating budget, and then uh, we pay our trucks, we pay everything, uh, even an extension. So it's very important to work as a team. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about different tactics about, for managing soil-borne diseases, and it's also, you know, a farming systems thinking. And so, as most of you know, methyl bromide was a fumigant that most growers used in the industry, especially here in the south, in Florida, and in California. In the southeast, it's been really important. As methyl bromide was being phased out, we did a lot of work, and I call them, you know, different generations, but we did them simultaneously, right? So the first one is tactic substitution. So a lot of growers came to us and said, okay, what other fumigant can I use? So the main criteria was it can't be an ozone depleting compound and it has potentially for being registered, potential for being registered. And so we did a lot of work on that and I'm gonna dance through that. Then, you know, what else can we do instead of fumigating? So I call that tactic diversification. What else can we do? Now, I'll, I'll highlight some work with strawberries, but if with tomatoes, you know, what we're doing a lot of work on right now is grafting. Uh, choosing rootstocks that have resistant to the diseases on the farm, but still putting your favorite tomato on it. And that's working, that's working well. And then tactic development, you know, well, how can we think differently, right? And then, you know, generation four, that'll be for our grad students and their grad students uh, to develop. And in our work, we have we had what we call phase one, phase two, and phase three projects. So phase one would be if it's a new product, a new method, we would do it on research station. Phase two, we would take it to the farm, but they tend to be smaller plot work. And then phase three is we go to a farm and we tell a grower, how many acres do you want to try this on? And some would say, well, a tenth of an acre. And some said, well, half my land, it might be five acres and for some of the growers, right? Um, so those were the phase two and phase three. So this is an example of phase three in South Carolina. You know, that grower put that whole land under different treatment regimes as he was phasing out of methyl bromide. And so we used their equipment, we used their fields, we used their plants, and we just made sure that, um, you know, sometimes we, we, sometimes we even bought stuff like flow meters and stuff like that to make sure everything ran well. All right, so that's, that's by way of the background. Um, now, what have... What, what are the options? You know, there's a chemical fumigants. So we've got the 1,3-D telone, which is really good for um, nematodes. 
chlorpicrin, which is a really good fungicide. A metanum sodium or potassium sodium and dimethyl disulfide. I'll talk about this new one that's coming on the market, WSP. Um, if some kids out the block, of course methyl bromide is off. And methyl iodide or iodomethane was registered, but the company re recently pulled it out of the market. Um, so, and then uh, non-chemical based approaches, and we'll talk a little bit about those also. All right, and I have grafting here, but that's of course not for strawberries. It won't work. <laughs> so I think, I think, you know, what the challenge for us was in the southeast, north of Florida, was that, you know, we didn't, most farms don't hire a person to manage all their fumigants, right, on the land. Whereas you go to Florida, you go to California, some of those farms, they, hire, they have their own people to manage their fumigants, right? But go. here, most people are doing it all themselves. They're managing the land, they're managing the crop. They might have another job, right? So, so, um, so we were able to get uh, critical use exemptions. Methobromide was supposed to be off the market in 2005, and we had critical use exemptions right up till last year. Last fall was the last time you could, I mean, uh, 2012 was the last time you could fumigate with methobromide. All right. Most of our operations tend to be family-oriented, local production, and in North Carolina, the average size is about five acres. Um, so we're really talking about the southeast north of Florida and I feel like that's where a, what our, our, a lot of our work applies to that region so that that applies here too um, just a couple of slides about history is um, these are the pioneers who who developed fumigation for strawberries in California and uh, Albert Paulus, he, he uh, has a daughter in North Carolina now and then he pops in in our place so he's, he's quite a character. But what it shows is when fumigants started, the amount of acres decreased substantially but the yield per acre increased substantially. Right? So a lot of that had to do with cultivar development, a lot of technologies, but one of it was fumigants. All right? And then worldwide there, was, there were a lot of fumigants um, uh, used, of course, in, in, in North America, California, Florida, and in the southeast. You can see mostly southeast states here. So we were really big into fumigants. And then you can see strawberries was an important part of that. About 13% of the methyl bromide used was for strawberries in the U.S. So methyl bromide, you know, the, the, the advantage of it was, was that one size almost fits all, fit all. Your soils could be a little bit cool, a little bit wet. Um, you could be a little bit, you had, could have a little bit of a poor soil structure, a good soil structure, but methyl bromide tend to be pretty forgiving. And most of the other fumigants are not. And also methyl bromide, especially when you mix it with chlorpicrin, um, controlled most of the pests that we were worried about. Some large seeded weeds it was not very good on. Um, so, uh, but most organisms were well controlled by it. And a person could do it, you know, we have a very small crew. In this case, this person, you know, low PPE, he's got sandals, shorts, sometimes he doesn't wear a shirt. Right? Because at that, you know, methyl bromide, is, it, it boils at four degrees Celsius. So once it hits the atmosphere, it immediately goes away as a gas. That's why it moved to the ozone layer. Um, so, but, but uh, historically, there was low plant protection requirements for methyl bromide. And unlike here, we prepare the beds in the fall with plant, and of course this is of course doing plugs. Then we manage it over the winter, and like Alina said, that could be very, <coughs> very challenging, um, you know, starting in the fall and growing the crop to spring, and then we're shooting for a great harvest in the uh, spring. Um, you know, usually 20 to 30,000 pounds per acre is what we would shoot for. The problem with methyl bromide, of course, was, as you see in 1979 up to 2003, this blue indicates the size of the ozone hole in the South Pole. And in fact, 2008, it was the largest it ever was. And so there's a depletion of the ozone, uh, and in part, methyl, and methyl bromide played a part. And the reason is, is because that methyl bromide, the bromine, which gets up there, it interactions, interacts with ozone, 
It breaks the ozone into oxygen. And then what's, what's nasty about this thing is that the bromine will return and do it again. It itself doesn't break down. It's a true catalyst, you know, so it just keeps on breaking down ozone. And so it was a, you know, it was a, a major concern. Uh, and then, you know, if you go into countries like Australia, high, high rates of skin cancer. So that's, that's a major concern is if we lose the ozone layer, we'll have substantially, we'll have substantial other problems. Uh, so the Montreal Protocol came in um, and to reduce the amount of uh, ozone depleting compounds and methyl bromide was classified as that. And there was a lot of fuzzy science and we don't need to talk about that too much. So let me talk about tactic substitution. I'm only going to show a few slides about that. Um, and just to show you how we did some of this work. So a lot of times in our larger trials we would have three row plots. And then we would take all our yield off that middle plot and in many cases, we came back to the same land three years in a row. Uh, and so we've, we've done a lot of trials on land that's new to strawberries, on land with a history of strawberries, always uh, replicated, and then we would take a lot of different type of data. Um, you know, we take the yields, of course, we take weed populations, we look at the uh, nematodes, we look at uh, diseases, and then we would look at, um, you know, the root, root parameters like root growth, etc. And we did a lot of work on characterizing the pathogens. So I, this is one slide of data and this was a, some of our earlier work. This is with Gina Fernandez who's um, a horticultural scientist at NC State. But this one slide really gives a good summary of the outcome in strawberries. And so um, this would be our yield per acre. So if we don't fumigate you see we get about 17,000 pounds. All right, now, and uh, we know, like Elena really talked about this, this uh, short day, long day type response, and the flower set that occurs in the fall. And, you know, if you had a crystal glass, you'd know exactly what's the best date to plant. And usually you learn it in the spring after. Oh, I should have planted two weeks earlier, two weeks later, right? But you have a, you have a magic date you know, depending on where you are in the state. And we know that it's more important to plant on time and not fumigate than to delay your planting two weeks. Like if you fumigate, because we have a big rain event, if you fumigate and wait two weeks to plant and you're two weeks late, you can, you can get a 50% crop. All right, so you gotta play around a little bit. And the reason is, is because we're not in California. We don't have the plant killers, like verticillium wilt that causes plants to collapse. And so what we have is we have plant stunters, and that's what happens with the yield here. We have the stunting of the plants, we have low yields. Then here's me the methyl bromide chlorpicrin. In this case, it was um, uh, 60, uh, 6733 formulation. Uh, and uh, so methyl bromide was our standard at that time. But you can see how all the other products performed. Uh, got straight chlorpicrin. Uh, it doesn't have any weed control, so you can't do it when you need weed control. Inline, which is a drip application of the Telen C35 formulation. And so this is two chemicals, 1,3-D and chlorpicrin, <coughs> 5%. Now, uh, the most common one on the market is pit chlor 60. So it's 60% chlorpicrin, 40% Telen, and it does quite well. And then the metam sodiums, metam sodium shank or drip applied. And you can see we can make them all work as well, if not better, uh, than methyl bromide. So most of our growers have transitioned, who still want to fumigate, have transitioned to one of these products. And just an example of some data. Uh, here's a 6733. Um, in this case, uh, so we hear that we got low yields because this trial we do at Castle Hain. And we get so pushed in the fall, we often plant this late, and so we get a, we do get lower yields there. Um, but in this case, you can see the methyl bromide, the Midas, which is no longer registered, the Telon did really well. Here's methyl bromide with uh, virtually impermeable plastic. We get a lot of better yield. Dimethyl disulfide, and um, yeah, and then the controls. You see how low the controls are. Uh, so we do see a, a, a major fumigant response. So just okay. an example of some data.
question. Yeah. Do you have a, a number or a feel even for the number of people that fumigate in Arkansas? Is that? I great? don't know. I don't know in this area. I don't have a sense for that. All of our commercial, larger commercial producers yeah. fumigate. Is that more in the south? More uh, north, uh, central Arkansas, and south. Um, because they are planting in the same ground, mm -hmm. like the, the smaller producers don't fumigate because they are able to move right. uh, their plantings. So let me, um, and then we put uh, numbers to that. Um, so just to see in terms of economics, and uh, if you take methyl bromide and set that as your standard, you, uh, you know, a, a grower would expect about $28,000 per acre in return. And then these other fumigants did as well, or slightly better than methyl bromide. And that was when the price was lower for methyl bromide. Of course, now it's gone. Um, and if you didn't fumigate, you lost about 6000 per acre. But you still, you still can make money. But you lost, you lost uh, about 6000 per acre compared to managing uh, the soil-borne diseases and weeds. So what are we controlling? This would be a really nice, healthy plant. Look at all those roots, nice, massive root system. And this is what we would call black root rot. The roots turn black, they lose their secondary roots. Um, a lot of the roots kind of take on a rat tail appearance. And so that's the main thing we're dealing with here in the southeast, is black root rot. Especially on land that goes uh, to strawberries again and again. And I'm going to skip through some of this. Um, we, did, we did a lot of work just to characterize, you know, plating it. We would take the roots and we would plate it and characterize those fungi. Use different techniques to characterize those fungi. And using um, molecular tools also. Uh, some more advanced tools. Uh, this is with a, a person who was in my lab, lab and also worked with Jim Carell for a while. Um, and then, you know, we were, we were really asking these type of questions. What, what organisms are present? What fungi? And then are they important to us? Do they come in on the plants or are they in the soil? And then how, how do these organisms with plant pathogens and beneficials, how do they change over time? All right, so I feel like we've gotten a pretty good handle on that um, to try and understand who the enemy is. And so when we think about our enemy, um, the main one is called Rhizoctonia frigare, uh, it likes strawberries. Uh, pythiums, which are really good at causing a root rot. These are the main ones. Then we have a bunch of fusarium organisms. Um, and we're trying to get a better handle on these. I have a postdoc, she's doing a lot of work. And overall, I would say they're not that important. They're just root nibblers. And then this afternoon, I'll talk about the Phytophthora crown rot. That's, that's a true plant killer. All right, and I'll, I'll come back to that this afternoon. Um, and then, yeah, we've, of course, in our lab, we need to prove that these are pathogenic to strawberries, and so we do that work here. Uh, if we don't inoculate, we have nice white roots, and if we inoculate, we get all kinds of black roots, uh, depending on the organism or the combination of organisms. So the strawberries is kind of kind of hard to work with because it's, the problem is complex, the black root rot. Uh, just to show you, this is in the mountains, of course, with tomatoes. We've done similar work. We have economics. Uh, we have products that do as well or better in tomatoes also. All right, so then in terms of on-farm work, uh, this, this is a trial that was done in Georgia. You can see we got, uh, this is after Telen C35. This was before the new fumigant regulations came in, right? Because this one's not, not wearing PPE at that point. Uh, probably, actually at that point, they're probably putting on methyl bromide um, since they don't have PPE. So what's been fun, and I think for agents and growers, you know, um, a lot of times when we ask a grower, hey, can we do a trial on your farm? They say, oh yeah, you know, why don't you put, why don't you put that treatment over there and then this treatment over here and this treatment over here, right? But what happens is this is all low land and it gets flooded then you don't know if it's the flooding or the treatment that had the effect. So most times we convince the grower to take a row and call that a treatment. And then we randomize them in the field. But you can see the way they randomize. There's a group of three here. Uh, well, I just, I don't have that randomized right. I'm missing a white line in there. <laughs> That's supposed to be white, I guess. 
But anyhow, we have a group of three, a group of three, a group of three. So we, had, we actually set it up in the farmer's field as a scientific experiment. And now what's really fun is a lot of times we convince the grower to keep track of all the yield. Mm -hmm. So we go there, we, we set up the trial, we give them the spreadsheets, we come back kind of like at the end of the season, collect the data from them, all written down. All right, so that's, that's how motivated a lot of our growers were, you know, to document the data and to drive the science. Um, and so we got great data. And we would come, you know, and sample plans, look for problems, etc. All right, so this is just some of the examples of on-farm work. You know, this one was not a replicated design, but uh, this grower measured in buckets per row. You can see untreated Picor 60 inline, which is a drip application of a product, and then methyl bromide, which was a 50-50 formulation. So those products did as well for the grower as a fumigant. And here weeds, we got lots of weeds, but we didn't fumigate and pretty good weed control. And this is number of holes with weeds. And here's another grower. Again, we got non-fumigated methyl bromide. This time we we're doing 50-50 and we we're really pushing down the rates, but we we're starting to compromise our control. And then here these fumigants uh, did well. All right, and then uh, with some of the new plastics, one is called totally impermeable film. We found this is, in this case, is tomato data. But you could take a hundred, um, here's methyl bromide 50 50. Um, and what you could do is you could take the pit chlor 60 rates and, and you could decrease, you could decrease the rate of the fumigant needed because the film would hold it in longer. So efficacy is time times concentration. So if you keep the fumigant in the soil longer, you get more time. All right. So let me dance along here. Um, I put this in just for your information. You know, the different ones that are fumigant, uh, different fumigants that are labeled, and then how well they control nematodes, disease, nut sedge, or annual weeds, which are the main problems we run into in strawberries. Uh, so uh, it just helps our growers uh, choose products for, uh, for fumigation. All right, then the only other thing about fumigants is um, uh, Triest, which is the only fumigant company now around, uh, they can custom formulate products with the Telum 2, the dimethyl disulfide, and chlorpicrin. And what that does, this tends to control nematodes well, this tends to control weeds better, this tends to control diseases. So depending on what problem you have, a lot of Florida growers are asking for more of this and less of that. So that's, you can get it uh, custom labeled. There's no I mean, custom formulated. There's no label for this product. You have to have each label uh, available to you. All right. So then let's just, uh, any questions about fumigation? Let's just stop there for a minute and breathe. As, if there's any questions about fumigation, yeah. Does anybody work with, the work with the radishes at all? Are you fumigating with the radishes? Yeah, I'll come to that. I'll come to that, yeah, because that's I want to talk about other systems and systems approaches. So that's a great question. Yeah. You know, I haven't like experienced fumigation here, but do you, so do you normally just put it under your normal plastic, or like uh, you were talking about totally impermeable film? Do you have to take that off and then put? No, no, that's okay. right. It's all one pass. Okay. Yeah, so you just buy the roll, whatever size you need for your for your rig, and and. Uh, most rigs, you might need to preform the bed a lot of times, but most rigs, you just pull that soil, it puts the drip tape underneath, it rolls out the plastic, the plastic gets tucked under the soil, you should have a nice tight bed when you're done. And, and it's also injecting the fumigant as you're going along. Now, with, uh, you know, there's all new regulations with fumigants and it's much more restrictive of who can apply it and when it can be applied. So some growers are moving away from applying it when they prepare the beds, and we can run it through the drip line. Yeah, yeah, so that's a great question. Yeah. What's the price cost difference in that plastic? It's, I don't, I don't know offhand, but mm -hmm. you know that they're gonna price it according to the market. <laughs> what the market can bear. So if you can knock off 50% of your fumigant, 
they'll probably eat about 40% of that or something. I'm not sure, but you know. Uh, so those numbers get crunched out by the salespeople. <laughs> so, but you know, the farmer makes more money and the company makes more money, right? That's always the goal, I think, of those companies. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know the prices offhand. Yeah, we do have it all in our budgets, but offhand I don't know. Is that budget online? Yeah, you know what we do? We have a, we have a strawberry portal. If you could do uh, NCSU strawberry portal, we would have those budgets. I don't know if we have those itemized separately off on there, but we would have, we could get that information. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? So now I want to talk about if you don't <coughs> eat. Right? Let's, let's talk about uh, if you're organic systems or if you want to have uh, non fumigant based, based systems. Mm -hmm. So, over the last two years, you know, as methyl bromide was really being phased out, especially for smaller growers, it was harder for them to get the product because it was in limited supply and it was pricey. And so, all of a sudden, you know, it'd be like end of July and August, oh, Frank, I can't get a hold of any methyl bromide. What can I do instead? <laughs> And, and you don't want to ask that question in July or August, right, if, you, if you're not planning to fumigate. I think you need to have a two-year plan in mind. You've got to think about rotation, you've got to think about cover crops, you've got to think about land preparation. And the next talk is probably going to highlight that really well. Right? So you want to think about uh, uh, preparing the land. And that all has to do with best management practices. And most of that I, I learned from growers, right? How do I care for my land? and make it work and everybody's land is different. I grew up on a farm. Um, I did a lot of growing of strawberries and vegetables. Um, you know, so as a scientist I have that advantage. Um, but still, uh, most of what I learned is from our growers, right? Okay, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna walk through some of those things. Um, John Vollmer was a real pioneer that we did some early work with and uh, John has a 26 acre farm, family farm, pays a lot of people's salaries. And he said, well, what, what can I do instead of methyl bromide? And we thought, well, you know what, you can, you can look at the components. Or what we did is we sat down and we just tried to work out the best system. And you know, some, uh, some people in science don't always get it because most scientists are used to thinking about changing one variable and, and you know, keeping everything else the same. But really, you know, we changed everything, right? And so what we were comparing is systems, not cover crop, not compost, the whole system, right? So, uh, and this was a graduate student uh, that worked with us, and so we just, we just did it. And so what that system is, is, and actually we modified a little bit in, in June or early July, depending on, on how much time you have, you would add compost. You gotta make sure you have a, like, enough soil moisture to get a cover crop established. You have a legume grass cover crop, all right? In this case, it's uh, um, pearl, uh, um, well, pearl millet and soybeans is what, what he grows a lot. Um, but anyhow, basically, you grow that in the summer because we've got about two months of good cover crop growth. So you grow your carbon there, and then we flail mow it in August, add compost, and then that's worked into the soil. And the compost, it's got to be good quality compost. Because um, if it's got high salts or if it's got other, you know, it's not good quality, it can do more damage than good. And so garbage in, garbage out. And at that time, John was making it himself using a system called controlled microbial compost, composting. But as it turns out, it was cheaper to buy it. Now there's a really good compost suppliers out there. And it was cheaper to buy it. And so we would work it in make the beds, and then uh, uh, plant the crop. And this is three years of work, uh, summary. So if we set methyl bromide at 100%, you see if we don't fumigate, we had an 80% crop that year. Um, in this case, the compost was about a 93% crop. Then the second year, on the same land, we went back to back. Now, you know, if you're organic, you want to have at least a two-year rotation in there. But my, my um, master's student, 
didn't want to take 18 years for her thesis. So I couldn't convince her to put a two-year rotation in there, you see? <laughs> so we had, to, we had to just go back to back. And we, what we did is we just pushed the system. Right? Normally, if you transition to organic, a lot of people say it takes about three years for you to build your soils and come to the level where you're starting to still feel satisfied with your land. Okay, so then that's a good rule of thumb. It takes three years to build your soils. Um, but in this case, uh, you see we're, we're getting more and more disease. We've got less, less um, yield on the controls. Methyl bromide 100%. And then in this case, compost did 104%. And in here, we got 101% with the Tillon C35. And in the third year, again, um, the control of methyl bromide, the compost, and then the Tillon. Now this, this, this is where we got caught. Uh, we had a hurricane event, we had 21 inches of rain. That compost land held a lot of water. <clears throat> all right, so now all of a sudden, we had to get that fumigant in, and we did delay planting. Um, but it, the, the land wasn't ready. That compost cover crop land wasn't ready for us to work. And I knew it, right? The land tells you, right? It's slick, you're gonna create a mess. Uh, but we had to move ahead. <laughs> Again, I had a thesis writing on it, okay? So, um, so yeah, so, so that system works well, all right? But again, you see, you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta be planning ahead. You gotta have the rotation system, you gotta have the cover crop, the right type of cover crop, you gotta plant them, you gotta know when to fill them all, you gotta know how much compost you need, when do you add the compost, and then you gotta make sure it's broken down enough before you plant and pull the beds. Uh, but that system works well. We had good success with that system. The other thing we did, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but for a while there, EPA was going to, said that anybody who fumigates has to have large borders between the field and any residential area. Well, I'm sure like here, you go in any strawberry field and someone's living really close by. So we did a fair amount of work to say, okay, what, what are we going to do with the land that's in those buffer zones? <laughs> And I call them dips and drips. All right, so we would take the plugs and we take the bare roots. We would treat them with a product. We knew who our enemy was. We knew when our enemy is active. So we knew what kind of products to apply at what time. So we tried to be smart about that. Now you can never outsmart plant pathogens, right? But you try to stay one step ahead. And what that does is, is here is pit chlor 16 methyl bromide. Uh, gave us the best yield, and our dip, dips and drips were kind of in the middle of the pack. So we could, we could see economic benefit, but we wouldn't do as good as fumigating. And then this is another one, Piclor 60 and methyl bromide, and I'll come back to this, but here's some of our dips and drips, and then also our mustard meal, and that comes back to the, the radish, and I'll come back to that too. All right, so with the mustard meal and the radishes, so the idea would be, um, you can grow with a cover crop, or you can add mustard meal as an amendment. All right, so mustard meal would have both direct and indirect effects, or the, the radish uh, crop. So you'd grow a cover crop, and then those cover crops has a, have this chemical glucosinolates. And when you break the cells, they are exposed to this enzyme, my, my, myrosinase. And what that does, it breaks down this chemical into a lot of different other chemicals. One of them is, is isothiocyanates. Well, the active ingredient of vapan, the fumigant, is a sister chemical to isothiocyanates. So if you can, if you can break down those plants, <coughs> capture that gas, <coughs> maybe you can fumigate out some of your plant pathogens and weed seeds. But it's tricky, okay, so I wanna, and, and we've done a lot of work with Carl Sams in Tennessee, especially to measure these gases as they're being released. Um, and there's also a product uh, out of Italy that's called BioFence. All right, and so what that is, is a company that has specifically bred crucifer crops, mustards, for high, high glucosinolate content. And then, so that if you use it, and they pelletize it, so if you use it, it can give a lot of this gas off. All right, that's the intent. It's not labeled as a pesticide. It's labeled as a soil amendment, right? So, um, and you can see why. It's got 6% nitrogen in it. So you, you, you might get pest control benefits, um, but you're using it, uh, you know, as a supplement. 
All right. So here's an example of a trial we did where we had mustard meal. This one is a byproduct coming out of Canada, out of the mustard industry. Okay. And um, and actually, <coughs> we're formulating it now because you can take one species, you can control pythiums. You take another mustard species, you can control rhizoctonia. You put them together. So. So the science is going to move ahead, I think, of using these type of products. Okay. So what it is is we preform the bed, we add the mustard meal, and then we rototill it in so it's well distributed through the profile. We immediately pull plastic. We immediately apply water because the gas is released within two to eight hours. And if you don't capture that gas, you lose it. So you have to cover it with plastic, and you have to keep that gas in the soil. Now what does happen is all these uh, amendments, you know, the organic matter content and stuff like that, and uh, we haven't done this work as much as, much as uh, some people at Washington, uh, Washington State in that area. What happens is you get this first kill of your plant pathogens, but then later you get a second phase of plant disease suppression and plant growth promotion. And what, what happens is you, the, that amendment shifts the microbes and what happens is you get a lot of streptomyces. So where do we get streptomycin from? You know, from these soil bugs. So they're producing compounds or they're doing something to the plant pathogens and they're killing the plant pathogens and or promoting plant growth. So we see a biphasic response to this. So that's, that's the core concept of the cover crops and the radishes. Uh, you can use it as a straight amendment or if you manage it right, you can also use it as a biofumigant product. Yeah. Is that one accepted by the FDA for organic? It would be. Biofumigant? Both of these would be OMRI approved. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so a company would need to specifically apply for it, but I believe Biofence is OMRI approved. Yeah. So, second question. The growers that you have worked with, do you see that much difference pricing between organic and chemical control? I mean, are they getting more money for their yeah, product? Yeah, generally, generally they do. They try to get a premium dollar for their product. Now, it depends where they live. Like John Volmer lives in a, in a county called Franklin County, which is where I live. It's very rural, and people won't pay that much more for a berry. So he's got a market to Wake Forest, uh, to Raleigh, where people are ready to pay a premium for that. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so on average, in his organic system, he would say that he runs a 75 to 80 percent yield compared to when he had fumigants. That's a statement that he made to me, using the best organic practices that he can. So it's it's a still a great yield. He's a very good grower, you know. And so he does he does um, you know and he markets them well. And if he like you know this year everything's getting pushed up. And we're going to have we have such a large load of fruit because the season's so late. Uh, so then he's got wholesale outlets also, in addition to retail. All right. I don't have a. Uh, oh, this is from uh, Jason Norsworthy, who's who's now here, I guess, right? Yeah. So this is some of the work that Jason did with weeds. Just show that um, you know, kind of with the wild radish or the glucosinolate products, you can get weed suppression. Um, all right, then final method is, that's kind of emerging. It's called this anaerobic soil disinfestation. And uh, so it started in Japan, then work was done in Holland, work in California, Florida, and we've done a fair amount of work with it now. The concept there is, is that you would pre-form the bed, uh, or you would grow, uh, just add a lot of debris, uh, I mean carbon to your field. But what you need you need a carbon source that's really ready to be broken down by microbes. You can't use Sudex that's already lignified, tough. You have to have very, very soft tissue. Or in this case, in Florida, they have lots of molasses as a byproduct of the sugarcane industry. So you want to find a carbon source that's a byproduct. You don't want to pay much for it. In, in um, California, they're using rice bran or rice holes. Or, you know, a byproduct from the rice industry. And Jim, there may be all kinds of product here. I don't know when you're rice we producing. Have a, we have a lot of rice holes. That's yeah, true. yeah. So what it is is you would you would apply that to the bed, and then you cover the bed with plastic, and then you flood the soil. So you you got to have a soil that can hold its water fairly decently. If you're on sandy soil, you might not do it. 
right? But then what happens is with all that carbon, all that water, you, you induce microbes. So the microbes will start eating the carbon, but then they'll use up all the oxygen. And then anaerobic microbes take over. And a lot of these anaerobic microbes will then produce certain types of compounds or, or, or uh, gases, which then affect weed seeds and plant pathogens. Or the anaerobic conditions themselves, most of our enemies are aerobic. And so if you have anaerobic conditions, a lot of pathogens and weed seeds are knocked out. And um, so, uh, and you would, you would, in this area, you probably need about a three week time frame to do that. So we would set it up about the end of July or early August. And depending on the planting date, you know, we want to hit planting about September 15th to October 15th, depending on if we're Eastern North Carolina or the mountains. And uh, so that's a, uh, you know, that's another approach. So we're adding carbon, but we're, we're managing that carbon to induce a certain microclimate that um, that knocks out weed seeds and plant pathogens. And then what we do is we go ahead and we punch the plastic before planting, about seven days before plastic planting or so, just so that soil becomes re-aerated. Um, this is some data I have from Florida. Um, it just shows, uh, in this case, this is fusarium. Uh, so this was tomato work, but if they didn't, um, treat the land, or if they did treat the land with molasses, this anaerobic condition, so you totally knock down that pathogen uh, or knock it down substantially. Uh, this is um, plant parasitic nematodes. We have a similar story with no control or these uh, products. This is from our trial from last spring. We finished. Right now, we're doing the second year of the trial, and here's our untreated control. You see quite a low yield there. There's our fumigant, there's our anaerobic soil disinfestation, right? And there's our cover crop compost system. So we're, we're not quite there, right? But this is uh, the first time we put these treatments on the land. Now, as you build your carbon resource reservoir in the soils, you might get a different response, but, but you know, weeds and plant pathogens will figure out a way to get around it and or you get new types. So you never want to rely on one method to control your systems, right? But, but it just shows really promising results. And we've also done a lot of work with David Butler in Tennessee and, and Carl Sams. Uh, here's our methyl bromide standard, all right? So we're, we're, we're in the neighborhood, all right? Now, like I said, with the methyl bromide, we're probably cutting our rates too much, all right? Here's Sudex, okay? What we did, and I thought, oh, what we can do is we can grow our own carbon. We have one field, we grow our carbon, Harvest it, add it to our next field for strawberries. So, but you gotta do it right, because that Sudex, what happened is we waited just a little too long and started getting lignified. So it totally tied up the nitrogen. Those plants were starved for nitrogen in the fall. And so we didn't, we didn't do it right there, all right? Um, very good. The good, the good news is about methyl bromide, you know, it's substantially decreased in use and People predicted that the, oz the, um, the abundance of uh, ozone depleting compounds would follow this blue line, but it's actually following this red line. So the decrease in ozone depleting compounds is going faster than people predicted. And they relate that a lot to our decrease in methyl bromide use. So I tell our farmers, you know what? We're not doing this for nothing. What the decision you made not to use methyl bromide is making a difference on the environment, all right? Um, whoops, I hit the wrong button there. And, you know, over the next 50 years, that ozone hole will hopefully heal. It's fuzzy science, but, uh, you know, it's encouraging. So that's, that's really what I want to highlight. You know, we got an A plus B approach to managing soil pathogens, or we have more of a systems approach. And, um, and there's, there's a number of options there. And I think the cover compost system works really well with rotation. That ASD, we're gonna go, we're gonna try and get it into growers' hands and more and more on grower farms. We're hoping to do a bunch of trials. We, we open, we've always had grower trials with this product or this method, but we wanna do more. So, um, yeah, hopefully it's time for more questions or discussions. Or questions? Yeah. Hi.
Have you um, ever looked at putting the biochar in for the increasing the carbon? I have not. You know, and maybe someone else can speak to that. Yeah. Um, biochar, yeah. Or anaerobic. Yeah, I have not. You know, but um, there's a lot of work going on in, in their area, and there's a lot of literature, and I'm not familiar with that. Up to speed on that. Yeah. At Mustard Seed Mill, I get some out of uh, California. Oh, you do? Okay. Farm, Farm Fuel, Inc. Okay. And they, yeah, the shipping cost is ETO. Yeah. Not that far. Uh, okay. They do sell the mustard seed also that you can plant. I use that and the mustard seed mill. Okay, so when you use a mustard seed, what kind of window do you have? When can you seed it? When can you turn it under? And then when can you plant your crop? That's what you have to be careful of because yeah. that mustard will kill, <laughs> it kills everything. And, right, okay. Uh, I, I think I left a, about a four week time period from the time I tilled it under till I, I set. And I was concerned about using the mustard and the mustard seed mill as a fertilizer and a fumigant combined, but they said it wouldn't affect each other. Okay. But I did notice a decrease in. Uh, Plant lo or some increase in plant loss. Uh, okay. I was using uh, bare roots, and I noticed I might have pushed the window a little too early, and I had some some loss. So you could grow that mustard crop in the summer. Yes. In your area, mm -hmm. and get a decent. And this was in high tunnels. Oh, okay. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. uh, you know some of those mustards aren't really suited. They're a cool season crop. Yeah. For sure. So they're not really suited for these the done, summer growth. These done, I mean, they was waist high. Okay. They just went, went to seed. They had to be careful. They said, don't let it go to seed. No, then you got to deal with it for exactly. years. So yeah. I went in there and, uh, of course, I low tech, I used a weed eater. Yeah. Which if, I, if you do do that, you better use long sleeves because that mustard will burn. It will burn. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the, the key trick is... Um, you know, you couldn't do it with a weed eater, but you know, I talked about the chemical and that enzyme and there are different parts of the cell. The more you mash that tissue, the better activity you get. So you really should use dull blades on a flail mower or something. But just whatever you can do to smash and mash that plant, the more uh, chemical activity you'll get. Mm -hmm. Now that may or may not be the main thing you're getting out of it because you're always adding a huge amount of carbon biomass there. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's there's it's always good to feed your soil, right? That's what I would say. But but I, I tilled it in as soon as I okay you know, yeah did, went right in there with my tiller. Yeah, and then what you could do is you could water seal it too mm -hmm. to capture the gas. Just just sprinkle water over top of it and put the water seal on it. And then you'll cap. Then that gas will be retained better, because it'll escape within two to eight hours, and up, you know, up to 24 hours. But if you, so after you till it, if your land's all flat, just put a water seal over it. For what, huh? What rate? What the water? Oh, I think I don't know. Just to just to get it nice and wet on top. I'm sure there's numbers on that. In fact, uh, yeah, energetic. yeah. Please do. We're, uh, we've done some of that work down here in our hot tunnels. Uh, we mostly have shifted over to using the farm fuel mustard seed meal. Mm -hmm. We did a trial uh, in combination uh, mustard biomass uh, in combination with uh, solarization in combination with the uh, uh, mustard seed meal. Uh, one of the things we found is most effective is using mustard seed meal, like he was saying, get it in as quickly as possible. We were actually going in and sealing it, rolling over the top of it with a light roller, watering it in. I think they recommended using at least an inch of rainfall or an inch of water. Okay. And then as soon as we got it watered, we put plastic over it. Okay. And further sealing those gases in. Yeah. So, so when they, when they, Matam sodium is the same, they use it with potatoes, so they would inject a product and then they have a differential roller to pack that soil and then they water water it. So, you know, so that that's, so rolling it would also be important. And that, that solarization, that is really nice. Like, I mean, this is a different topic, but a lot of growers have high tunnels, really have a problem with white mold. 
and lettuce and this summer activity of growing a cover crop, putting it under and then solarizing and let it cook, that, that really does a nice job for some of the soil borne pathogens. We, one of the results that we, it wasn't really part of the research, but we had a, one of the tunnels down there, we had permanent crops in blackberries, raspberries, and grapes. And we took our grapes out uh, this winter and breezed the isms. We had contracted a uh, nematode vector virus. And we just wanted to get rid of them. There's a lot of nematode buildup in that soil. And we did soil tests, brought them over here to the lab and I had counted. And I don't remember what all kinds they were, but also in our strawberry house where we've been in the management practice, been using the solarization uh, biofumigation, we uh, soil tested there. They couldn't hard, hardly find a nematode in that house. And that was probably eight, nine months after we pulled the plastic off and started getting the soil ready to plant. Very good. Any other questions? We're eating into our break time, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, so we're Excellent. going to take a I'll short be around. break. Thank you. We're going to take a short break. There's muffins back here. There's some coffee and drinks out in the hall. I'm not sure I can attack it. It'll take about 20 minutes. Yeah, but we do work all of the